Hey guys, well this will be something different. Um, this is one of my favorite chapters, The Heart, um, but due to our dear not friend Irma, we're going to be doing this online. Um, so here we go, The Heart is fascinating. Of course it's essentially the what? It is the pump which moves the blood throughout the circulatory system. You know I love fun facts, so there's about there are 60,000 miles or so of blood vessels that your heart pumps through um, in the systemic system, which is the system that goes to your body. And the heart pumps about 3,600 gallons per day. Of course, the heart sits. You can see it's sitting between or... Um, in the middle of both lungs, um, it's attached by some connective tissue down here in the diaphragm. And now let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so let's talk about the pericardium. Of course, peri means surrounding, so this is the layer surrounding the heart itself. Okay, the pericardium, which is here, um, has two main parts. Okay. You have the fibrous, which I'm writing here, and serous pericardium. Okay, the fibrous is this outer, stronger um, layer um, made of what kind of tissue would you guess, making the outside tough layer? Yes, yeah, so this is the. Um, the fibrous pericardium, which is made of dense, irregular, my stylus isn't working very well, connective tissue, CT for connective tissue, that's dense, irregular connective tissue, okay? The function of this fibrous layer is, is literally to prevent overstretching of the heart, okay? So it confines the heart, all right? Now the inner layer, or the serous layer, has two parts. So the serous has two parts, okay? You have the parietal and the visceral layers, okay? Or well, here's the visceral layer and the parietal layer, okay? I'm going to go ahead and change the pointer, maybe, okay? So let's start with the... Oh, can't move that. And the parietal layer. That's what I want. The parietal layer. Okay, so do you guys remember parietal versus visceral layer? Um, viscera are the internal organs. So the visceral layer is the layer of the serous pericardium. That is exactly against the heart wall, which is this one right here. So you guys can see. This is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, also known as the epicardium. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, the outer layer or more superficial layer is right here. This is the parietal layer of the serous pericardium, okay, which is adjacent and right next to the fibrous um, layer. Between these two layers, the visceral and the parietal and visceral layer of the serous pericardium, you have the pericardial cavity, okay? So here is a cavity and we'll talk about that space in just one second. Okay, the pericardial cavity. Switch to the pen. Okay, this is the fluid filled space. Fluid filled space between the layers of which layer of the pericardium? The serous pericardium. Okay, <clears throat> so the cavity itself is the space, and filling that space, this is filled with serous fluid. All right, hopefully you guys read, serous fluid is what? How, how does it feel? Serous fluid is very slippery, okay? 
So this fluid is there, it's very slippery, so what is it for? Helps to prevent and or reduce friction. Okay, hopefully your heart will continue to move for quite a long time to come. So every time your heart beats, it's going to be pushing against these layers. So that's sort of a lubricant, this serous fluid, to allow for reduced or no friction. Why do we want to avoid friction? I'm leaving space, by the way, so you can think about the answers. <laughs> we reduce, we, friction will cause heat, and heat leads to damage of proteins. When proteins are damaged, they don't function. Cells have a hard time functioning, etc. So friction in the body um, is generally very bad. Okay, so uh, here's the analogy if I switch to my pointer. Okay, so here is the heart. Imagine the pericardial cavity is a balloon filled with the fluid. Okay, and you push the heart into this balloon, so to speak, okay, until there is a layer of the balloon that is adjacent to the heart. Of course, this is representing the visceral pericardium. There's a layer around that. This would be the parietal pericardium, and here is the cavity between them lined with serous fluid. Of course, this cavity is not going to be this filled. This is more for illustration purposes. If the person actually looked like this, they probably have pericarditis. And that's very no bueno. Okay, so just to review, pericardial cavity um, is superficial to the heart, um, helps to prevent overstretching and reduce friction overall. All right, so now let's go to the actual heart itself. All right, so here is the heart wall, and there are three layers. The epicardium, epa means the surrounding. Okay, so the epicardium is the outermost or most superficial layer of the heart wall which I'm tracing right here with the red dot okay that is the exact same tissue as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium I know two names for the same thing so sorry okay <laughs> um, but there you have it okay um, about 95 percent of the heart wall itself is made up of the myocardium. Of course, myo means muscle. So it's comprised of spiral bundles of, you guessed it, cardiac muscle. Yeah, it's named cardiac for a reason. Okay. The myocardium also has what's called the fibrous skeleton of the heart. Um, this is comprised of a crisscrossing interlacing layer of connective tissue. Of connective tissue, which we're going to go over the functions of more specifically in a little bit. So you can see why it's called spiral bundles here. You can see they're wrapped around what? What are these appearing to be wrapped around? The chambers, the two atria, and then the ventricles down below. Okay, finally we have the endocardium. Endo means inner lining. Okay, so this would be the endocardium, this layer just um, the most deep layer in this case that's actually facing the lumen of the heart where the blood would be. Okay, this is a very smooth lining and it's endothelium. What does endothelium mean? Dig back to <clears throat> your connective tissue stuff from last semester or AMP1. Endothelium is also known as a type of epithelium called simple squamous epithelium. Why would you want it to be squamous? <clears throat> because squamous is smooth and you don't want any extra turbulence. So endothelium is simple squamous tissue that lines the chambers of the heart and all of the vessels of the body. Okay? You don't want nice smooth flow of blood. All right, now let's move on to the actual chambers. Space is inside, surrounded by the muscle. So, by now you probably know that your heart has four chambers. Okay, there are two atria, or what we call, oops, got to change to the pen, receiving chambers. Okay, these are the chambers that are going to be receiving blood, either from the systemic circulation or from the body or from the lungs okay and then you have two ventricles these are known as the pumping chambers
Okay. They are the chambers that pump the blood either to the lungs or to the body. Okay. Um, sulci, which is here, or each sulcus, these are the grooves that mark um, where the boundaries are between the atria and the ventricles, or each atrium or each ventricle. Okay. Um, it's the connective tissue boundary. There's going to be blood vessels and some fat and nerve um, fibers as well. Okay, an example is the coronary sulcus, which I will show you in just a second, which is the boundary between the atria and the ventricles, which is, is really important, which we'll come to in a few minutes. Okay, so now we're going to look at the structure of the heart, and this is going to be hard to do without being in front of you, but I will do my best. All right, back to the pointer. Okay, so now we're looking at the um, exterior surface of the heart. All right, so the main vessels coming in and out. You have your vena cava, you have the superior vena cava. This is bringing blood back from the upper portion of the body above the heart. All right, that's the major veins feeding into the heart here, into the right atrium. You have the inferior vena cava bringing blood up and this is bringing from all the areas below the heart here, okay? Then you have the aorta, which is the main vessel bringing blood out of the heart to the body. All right, and here's the pulmonary trunk, which is the main um, vessel taking, it's also an artery, taking blood away from the heart to go to the lungs, okay? So what is the difference between red versus blue? Hope you're not saying red means artery, blue means vein. That's wrong. Red means oxygen rich in these types of pictures, and blue means oxygen poor blood. Okay? Um, often it's correct if you're in a systemic circulation, yes, all the red things will be arteries and all the blue things will be veins. But the pulmonary circulation, you'll see that's not the case. Also, with the fetal circulation, that's also true as well when we get to the end of the semester. Okay, so here are some things that we talked about in the last time. So the sulci, okay, the coronary sulcus right here shows you this boundary right here. So you can see it's lined with, again, blood vessels and there's some adipose tissue there. That's dividing the heart into the atria and the ventricles side. Okay, um, these little flappy looking things, these are called oracles. These are uh, like expandable pockets of each of the atria. This is the right atrium. This is the left atrium. This allows for expansion when they are filling with blood. Okay, so there's the word oracle in case you're trying to figure out what that is um, of both of them. All right, just to do some more labeling here. This is... Um, the right ventricle, this is the left ventricle, okay, so this is the interventricular sulcus is right here, that's the dividing line between those two chambers. Up here, this is the right atrium, and this is the left atrium, which is kind of around the back side of this picture, um, just so you can get a picture where everybody is. Uh, is there anything else on here? I think I'm going to go through the flow on a picture that's cut out. Okay. So let's go to the next picture and talk about the flow of blood in the heart. Okay. So here's the internal anatomy. So we've taken uh, sort of a sagittal, um, probably more of an oblique section. So we're going to talk about a blood cell. So let's call him. Here he is. You guys know I can't draw. He's going to be Harry, the RBC, or the red blood cell. So we're going to talk about his journey and where he goes in the heart. All right, so Harry, if he was hanging up in your brain somewhere, would come down. So now I've changed to a different arrow so you can see it. <laughs> no red or blue can be seen very easily on these um, CV images. Okay, so Harry comes down. Yoop. In this case, through the superior vena cava into which chamber? This would be the right atrium, okay? The right atrium is also filled by um, blood coming back from the body and the inferior vena cava from the lower structures. And also, um, 
the coronary sinus, which is the drain of the cardiac circulation as well. So this chamber will fill with blood. Okay. When the blood, then the blood will move. I'm just gonna. We'll talk about pressure changes later on. Then the blood will move through a valve into the right ventricle. Okay. So the valve it moves through to move from the right atrium into the left. Oh, right atrium into the right ventricle is the tricuspid valve, which is right here, also known as the right AV or atrial ventricular valve. Okay. When it comes through here. Its next step is to push up through another valve called the pulmonary valve, pulmonary valve, into the pulmonary trunk, okay? This is an artery because arteries take blood away. So even though it's blue, that just means it's what? Low oxygen, okay? Pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries, okay? So now this blood is going to go off and go to the lungs, and through processes we'll learn in a couple chapters from now, uh, diffusion will occur, CO2 will be released into the air of the lungs, we'll pick up oxygen in the blood, and the oxygen will come back to the heart via pulmonary veins. So here are the left, left pulmonary veins, and here are the right pulmonary veins, coming in right here and right here. Okay, they're veins, veins bring blood to the heart, okay? And they're red, of course, because they have a high oxygen content. And they are entering, so these are going to enter behind the back side of the heart, over here into the left atrium, okay? So blood's going to come back from the lungs to the heart into the left atrium, right? Then it's going to move through this valve here, which has, unfortunately, three names. I know, what a pain, okay? It's called the left AV, or atrial ventricular valve, or the bicuspid valve, or another name that's not here is another another alias is the mitral valve. Okay. Unfortunately, all of those are going to be used fairly often, and um, that's just something you have to learn. Okay. So the blood Harry's moving from the left atrium through the bicuspid mitral left AV valve into the left atrium. Okay, so from here, I wish I could turn this arrow, but I can't. Harry's going to swing up. There's a valve up in here. Okay, that you can't see very well based on the angle of this image. This is the aortic valve, okay, which, of course, is going to allow Harry to enter into the aorta. So he's going to go behind these structures here, up into the aortic arch, all right, and then off um, either back to the heart, to this coronary circulation, or to all of the systemic arteries and arterioles, etc., to bring oxygenated blood to all the body tissues. Okay, so a few other structures that I want to point out before we move on. Okay, so the atrial ventricular valves, or the valves between the atria and the ventricles, okay, here and here, um, these have some specific structures that I want to highlight for you. All right, so these are the valve kind of cusps, all right, and these cusps are anchored by these strings. The kind of common term is heart strings, okay? But the appropriate term is chordae tendinae, which is not in this image. So let me write that for you. So these are labeled as Oops. My stylus is not cooperating. So chordae tendinae. Oops. Okay, or heart strings. Okay, those heart strings are attached to spe specialized muscles as part of the myocardium called papillary muscles. So here's the title right here, papillary muscles. So there's some over in the left ventricle and in the right ventricle. Okay, these structures become very important for how these AV valves work. Okay, so we'll highlight that um, in a little bit. I want you to see the structures. Okay. So I alluded to before, there's a fibrous skeleton in the myocardial layer of the heart wall. All right, it's really important, so now we're going to highlight that. Okay, so fibrous skeleton is dense connective tissue. All right, uh, if you look, here are the main valves that we just spoke about. All right, you have your aortic, 
pulmonary bicuspid, which of course is bicuspid because there's two cusps, tricuspid because there are three. All right, you see this really strong tissue here. The heart is working under tremendous pressure as the blood is pumped through squeezing of the muscle. So all these valves have to be anchored appropriately with really strong tissue, which of course you'd pick connective tissue. So this connective tissue, um, this fibrous skeleton has three main functions. The first one is to um, prevent overstretching. Okay. It also found like the structural. It is a structural foundation of the heart. Kind of holding all the valves in place. Okay. It's also serving sort of as an analogous to the tendons for the skeletal for the skeletal muscle. It's the point of entry for the muscle bundles. Okay, so the muscle bundles come out from this point. Okay, and the third, which let me uh, whoops erase. So I have a little space here. Okay, is it serves as an electrical insulator. between the atria and the ventricles. Now this is something that I'm going to go over with you in person. I'm going to try to describe it to you quickly, um, but it's really hard to do if you can't see my hands, okay? Um, an electrical insulator just means that whatever action potential is occurring to stimulate contraction of the muscle is not allowed to move. It's like the uh, insulating a layer around a electrical cord that you plug into the wall. Okay, so the atria and the ventricles need to be um, isolated from each other electrically because the heart works as a pump. The top or the atria need to contract. They push blood into the ventricles. Okay, then the atria need to relax, and then the ventricles contract. Okay, if this electrical insulator was not there, the atria would get excited and action potential would sweep along them and then it would just keep going and the atria and the ventricles contract at the same time and then the ventricles would contract before they are full and that would be very inefficient as a pump. So for the heart to work where the atria contract and relax and the ventricles contract and relax, there has to be an insulating layer there and as we go through the cardiac cycle and other things later on, You'll see why this is critically important, and we'll go back to that. Okay? All right. So now to some important terms. Diastole and systole. Okay? These terms should sound familiar to you if you've ever heard of blood pressure or what those two numbers are. So what is blood pressure? It's a something number over another number. So blood pressure is, what is it? systolic over diastolic. Which number is always higher? This one is always higher, the systolic, okay? So would you suspect that your blood pressure is higher when the heart and the ventricles are contracting or when they're relaxed? So would blood pressure be higher when the ventricles are squeezing blood and pushing the blood into the arteries or when they're relaxed? Of course it's when they're contracting. Okay, so systole is literally when the myocardium is contracting. Okay. Of course, diastole is when the myocardium is relaxed. All right. So think diastole means kind of like to dilate, to relax. Dilating your pupils means they get bigger. There's a, more space for light to get in. If you dilate your blood vessels, they get wider. Okay. Um, so systole and diastole are conditions of contraction of the myocardium, all right? Um, and there is a specific pattern, which we mentioned before, that the atria 
will contract and relax together, and the ventricles contract and relax together. All right. So now we've talked a little bit about all the structures of the heart, um, but we've left off the valves. So how do these valves work? Um, here we go. This is another one of those things that's going to be hard to do without being with you, but we will give it a shot. Heart valves. Okay. Um, first, all valves in the body have two things in common, even heart valves. Okay. They open and close based on pressure changes. So pressure is one of the terms you're going to hear in AMP2 over and over and over again. Okay. Um, and they also allow one-way flow. So in other words, blood moves only one way through a valve and not backwards. All right. So I want you to think about why. Why do we want blood to only move one way? Okay, so let's go through the flow of blood with these. Okay, so right now, this is kind of a funny image. You basically took a heart, and if you're looking at it, you take a nice transverse section, and you cut off the atria. Okay? That's generally what we're looking at here. Okay? So the atria are missing. So if I am a blood cell, let's say I'm hairy, okay, and I'm hanging out right here. If I'm above this valve, what chamber am I in? This is the tricuspid valve, so first is it the left or the right side? It's the right side of the heart. I know it feels backwards in this image, but it isn't, okay? So this is the right side, so if I'm above this, and this image, like I'm above it on the screen, I, this blood cell would be in the right atrium, okay? So, if I'm hairy and I'm coming back into the right atrium, the three main vessels that feed the right atrium are the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. So, all of these are bringing blood back into this chamber, okay? When the pressure inside the atrium is greater than the pressure inside the right ventricle, which is below this, these little cusps push down into the screen, down into the ventricle, and blood will move from up here down into the ventricle below. Okay? You don't want blood to come back up into the right atrium from the right ventricle because that's backflow. It's reverse. You want blood to move into the ventricle because from the right ventricle, where are we going? We're trying to get to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Okay? So, now that we're down in the right ventricle, which I can't show you on this image because it's below what you can see. When the ventricle contracts and the pressure in the right ventricle becomes higher than the pressure inside this pulmonary trunk, which is right here, okay, the pulmonary valve will open. So these little cups will, will pop open and blood will shoot out whoop, this way into those pulmonary arteries, go to the lungs, pick up oxygen, drop off CO2, and they're going to come back to the heart um, into which chamber? They're going to come back into the left atrium, which is sitting just above this in this image. Okay? Okay, so this is the left side of the heart. All right, you can't see the um, pulmonary veins, but, they're, but they exist. Okay? So now Harry's sitting above here in the right, I mean in the left um, atrium. Okay? When the pressure in the right uh, the left atrium, geez, I'm sorry, and this left atrium is greater than down below in here in the left ventricle, this bicuspid mitral or left AV valve will open, blood will move down, and these little flappies will push down into the chamber, and blood will move into the left ventricle, okay? So the left ventricle will fill, the atria above will contract to push some more blood in and relax, and then when the ventricles contract, when the pressure in the ventricle below here is greater than the pressure in the aorta above this, then this aortic valve, these little cups, okay, will be pushed up and out. So this one, this will go like this, whoop, this one will go like that, and this one will kind of go like this. Blood will shoot out at your face, almost, <laughs> on this image, and go into the aorta, to go bring blood to all of the um, spaces and tissues in the body. Okay, I hope this is coming across okay to you guys. Alright, so now we've kind of gone through 
where the blood is going and the one-way flow, but now we're going to break it down and talk about exactly how atrioventricular valves work between the atria and the ventricles, and then the semilunar valves, which are the aortic and pulmonary valve categories. Okay, beautiful. So there's a lot of work. Hold on, my thing is not working right now. All right, let's see if my, okay, my, we're back up. All right, so there's a lot of text right here, which is important, um, but I'm not going to read this to you. It's right there. I'm going to describe it to you using these images, okay? So in this picture, here we have the heart. This is the right side. This is the left side. Capillary muscles, okay, which are attached to the myocardium of the ventricle, see, right here, are relaxed, all right? So the next step is, we've moved blood from the atria to the ventricles, now we need to pump blood from the ventricles into the aorta in this case, okay? So, as the ventricle begins to contract, all right, blood is going to push up on the cusps, okay? So because they're cusps, the blood will push and they will close the cusps back together again, making a perfect seal. However, there's such great force generated that these anchors also play a role in maintaining this closure of the valve. Okay, So while the ventric ventricular myocardium is contracting, these papillary muscles are also contracting, so they are pulling down on the chordae tendineae preventing this guy from flapping back open the opposite way. We don't want it to open up here, okay? We want it to stay closed because we want the blood to move now from the ventricle here into the aorta. We don't want it to go back up into the, the left atrium because that's backwards, okay? Blood always needs to be moving to the next location to either go feed the tissues or go pick up oxygen and come back, all right? So it's always a one-way flow. So make sure you pay attention to the details of the chordae tendineae when they're slack, when they're tight, and then the papillary muscles role in maintaining this closure uh, for how these atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves work. And again, most of that, what I just said, is in text right there. Okay. So now on to the semilunar valves. The semilunar valves are the valves that are between the ventricles and the large arteries of the heart, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. So these are the aortic valve on the left side between the left ventricle and the aorta, and the pulmonary valve, which is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. Okay, just like the other valves, they open when the pressure in the ventricle is greater than the pressure in the arteries. Okay, so right now, um, let's say this is the aortic valve, it doesn't really matter which one. Okay, so above this, this is like a little cup, all right? This could fill with blood here, right here and right here. These are cusps. Down in there, if you could peek down in there, that is the left ventricle down below these cusps, okay? So right now this valve would be closed, which would indicate that the pressure above in the aorta is greater than the pressure down here because it's not open, okay? But this valve will open when the pressure down in the ventricle is greater than up here in the aorta. Okay, and what will happen is it's pretty obvious. As the blood is squeezed in the ventricle when it contracts, these cusps pop up, okay, and blood will shoot out at your face, all right, into the aorta. Okay, so that's during contraction. All right, so the ventricle contracts and then it quickly relaxes. So when it relaxes, what's going to happen to the blood? Is it going to just keep moving on its own? Now, some of it's going to want to fall back 
down the aorta into this space, but we don't want it to go back into here, all right? So what happens is, is these little cusps fill with blood and they all fall back down into place. It should line up perfectly. This is from a cadaver, so it might not be perfect sometimes. But I, ideally, this would be a perfect seal so that blood would stay in the aorta and keep getting pushed onto the body and not go back down into the heart itself. Okay? Page 2. Alright, so you may have noticed that there are no valve places. Alright? So if you look, um, the atria all right, of the heart, the left and right, um, so let's look at the right atrium. So here's a superior and inferior vena cava, okay? Veins, which you'll learn in the next unit, um, are not very thick walled, all right? They're easily collapsible because they have to be low pressure um, vessels, okay? So when the atria, like this is the, le the, right vent, the right atrium, okay? When it contracts, the muscle around where these big vessels feed in contracts and basically pinches off these vena cava so the blood moves into here and it doesn't go back out of the vena cava okay all right so of interest to me um, and my family especially um, are two valve um, issues clinically okay so the first one is called stenosis and this is a narrowing of the valve opening which I don't have here um, but when this occurs if a valve opening is too small what do you think can happen the pressure of the blood in that smaller space is going to be more intense the ejection of blood is going to be less efficient and potentially there could be remodeling of that vessel itself like the aorta especially um, which could lead to bursting of the aorta and I'll tell you the story when I see you but this is what actually happened to my grandfather uh, he wouldn't get surgery and so his aorta literally burst um, because of stenosis okay another thing is a prolapse valve so I actually have mitral valve prolapse all right so if you look over here a normal mitral valve the cusps are nice and they're anchored by the who cordy tendine okay and some people including myself and my grandmother um, this is a prolapse valve. So this little part of the cusps is not anchored, all right? So when the chorea tendinae are being killed by the papillary muscles, this little piece of the cusp is not anchored, and so the pressure of the blood being pushed up here, some of it, if it's bad, can what's called regurgitate and go from the ventricle back up into the atrium. So why is that a problem? Because that's not where we want it to go. If we're down here, let's say this is the mitral valve, we don't want our blood to go back up into the left atrium. We want it to go where? Into the aorta, right? So if we're in here, this is the blood here. We're in this one. We don't want the blood to go this way. We want it to go up and out, up this way, okay? We don't want it to go backwards. We want it to go up through the aortic valve into the aorta to the tissues, okay? So that's mitral valve prolapse. Um, in some people, it's absolutely no issue. Um, but again... There are four heart valves. They open based on pressure. They allow one-way flow. Okay, so I've alluded to the systemic versus the pulmonary circulation before. So here's a nice schematic to help you visualize um, what I'm talking about. Okay, the systemic circulation is what you think of that's a majority of your veins and arteries and your capillary beds, okay, the majority of them. So, um, if we, this, this square is of heart, all right, so blood that's nice and oxygen-rich because it's red, leaves, goes into the aorta, okay, and all the systemic arteries to smaller arteries, arterioles, and eventually goes into capillary beds and all vascular tissues in the whole body and your toe, and your elbow, and your kidney, you name it, everywhere, okay? And the capillary is where exchange occurs, and you can see over the capillary bed, these are those tiny blood vessels that allow exchange of sugars and waste, etc. Oxygen leaves, so it turns kind of purple and then blue, and CO2 comes in. So capillary beds connect to small veins, venules, veins, and then into the major veins, and the heart, and the coronary sinus, and the inferior and superior vena cava, and this feeds into the heart, into the right atrium, which we've already discussed. So all of this 
is the systemic circulation. So when someone says their blood pressure, they're talking about the systemic blood pressure. You measure the, measure the pressure in your systemic arteries, okay? So then the blood comes in, it's already been used, it's low oxygen, it goes in the right side of the heart, moves through the tricuspid, the right ventricle, pulmonary valve, and now we're leaving the heart again to go in the pulmonary trunk and arteries, okay? So now we're entering the pulmonary circulation. <clears throat> this blood goes through a series of vessels into special capillaries in the lungs, okay, where this now blue blood that's low in oxygen becomes oxygenated, okay, it loses its CO2, so it gets, becomes decarboxylated. All right, and that freshly oxygenated blood comes back to the heart via pulmonary veins and other vessels and back to the heart. So this is a pulmonary circulation, okay? So this is one circuit. Here's another circuit, and the heart is the one kind of directing the traffic of blood um, into and out of both of those systems, okay? Um, now that we know... The blood flow through the heart and more about how the valves work. We're going to talk through Harry's journey through the heart another time, but with more specific details. Here we go. I wish I could have this come up to you one at a time as these numbers pop up, but that's just not the reality of what we're dealing with right now, and it's hashtag make it work with Arma. Okay, so... Let's start um, Harry. So Harry, pretend he's here. He's down your toe. He's going to cruise up through all the systemic veins and eventually come up the inferior vena cava into where? This is the right atrium. Good. Okay. When the pressure in the right atrium is greater than the pressure in the right ventricle, this valve opens. What is this valve? The tricuspid, right atrioventricular valve. So these cusps push in, and Harry, whoop, slides down into the right ventricle. Cool. All right. Then the atria will contract, pushing more of Harry's friends down into here. All right. So then the atria will relax. The atrium will relax. Now the ventricle will start to contract. Okay, so here is the myocardium of the ventricle. When it starts to squeeze, the blood's going to be pushed up, and what's going to happen? This valve will close. Blood will push the cusps up, papillary valves pull the cord tendinae to prevent backflow, and the blood is then pushed up through what valve? This one right here, the pulmonary valve, into the pulmonary trunk when the pressure in the ventricle is greater than the pressure in this large artery. Okay? Blood will then flow up into the lungs, pick up oxygen, drop off CO2, and then it comes back to the heart either via the left pulmonary veins or the right pulmonary veins into which chamber? The left atrium. Okay? So then the left atrium um, is connected to the left ventricle. Blood or hair will move from here down into here when the pressure in the left atrium is greater than the pressure in the left ventricle. Okay? This, the mitral valve, bicuspid valve, left AV valve will open, the cups push in, hair will slide on down into the right, or the left ventricle. Okay? Then the atrium will contract, push more blood in, and it'll relax. Now the ventricle will contract and then push on the blood, closing this valve and then opening the aortic valve to allow Harry to push when the pressure here is greater than in here. Push this valve open and enter the aorta into the systemic circulation of arteries to go off to all the tissues. All right, cool. You're getting better with that, I hope. And you can say it with me as I do this. All right, so now um, one last piece that's pretty important, which is called the coronary circulation. But out that coronary means something to do with the heart, okay? So your heart tissue itself, especially the myocardium, <clears throat> needs its own circulation. This is the heart's own circulation, okay? For one, one whole set of chambers, the right side, doesn't have good blood in it, all right? The left side, even though it has good blood, that tissue is so thick, there's no way there's enough oxygen to feed this tissue that can never get tired. Your heart has to keep pumping, hopefully for many, 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 many years to come, okay? So that's why it's needed, okay? So the myocardium has a series of vessels. So if you look on this left image, these are all in red. So these happen to be the coronary artery. So you've probably heard of coronary artery bypass, all right? So this is the left coronary artery. Here is the right coronary artery, all right? And they come down and they branch off and branch off, all right? 
So these are the main arteries um, that you can see it comes off the aortic arch, so the blood leaves the left side of the heart and then comes back down in the coronary circulation to go feed all the capillary beds in the myocardium so that all that cardi cardiac muscle can get oxygen and glucose, etc., to keep doing its thing. Okay? Of course, they are capillary beds, so that means there has to be a system of veins as well. Okay? So all of those uh, capillary beds dump into a series of veins, and all of these will eventually dump into what's called the coronary sinus, which I've mentioned before. So a sinus is basically uh, kind of a balloon space in a blood vessel with no muscle around it, so it's just a collecting space. This coronary sinus then collects all the blood from this coronary circulation and then dumps it into where? The right atrium, okay? All right, so there's um, one special feature of... Um, the myocardium, and that it, ha it has a lot of anastomies. It's not the only place, okay? So anastomies provide alternative routes or collateral circuits. So there's more than one way for blood to get to every single part of the heart muscle. Um, what's the function of this? Why is this important? Basically, it's so that the heart muscle... Um, receives oxygen even if an artery is partially blocked. So if one artery is blocked, there's another way, there's an alternative method. It's just like if I-95, if I I'm on this coast now, is blocked, you have the turnpike, or you have US-1, or you have Congress. Okay, there are alternative routes to get to the same thing. So think about traffic. Um, if there's only one way to get down here, and you lived up in Jupiter, and there's an accident on 985, you're not getting here to school. Okay, so the heart muscle can still get oxygen even if one artery is blocked or partially blocked. Okay, kind of important. Okay, so that helps you prevent what? So what happens or what is it called when you have a blocked coronary vessel? equals a myocardial infarction, also known as a heart attack. Okay, so this is where you have a blocked vessel, the collateral circuits are not enough, so you have tissue that is now receiving no oxygen, so this cardiac muscle um, these muscle cells, these myocytes, are very high in their m metabolism of energy. They need energy all the time. They need to be doing um, aerobic respiration to make ATP to fuel that contraction cycle. They're not getting it. They're going to start to die. Okay? And so that's what actually happens with a heart attack. Part of the myocardium itself actually dies. All right? If there's a decrease in blood flow... All right, that means there's not a block, but this is called ischemia. Okay, and this leads to a condition called angina. Okay, still no bueno. That means you need to go see your cardiologist um, and go get a catheterization to see if there's any blockages in these vessels. All right, so if any of you, you can't raise your hands, but many of you are sitting there listening to this somewhere in your world, know someone who's had a coronary bypass. Okay, so coronary bypass is legitimately when there is a blockage, let's say here, and this vessel here. All right, there's a big blockage here. Okay, that's not bueno because there's not a lot of alternatives for this one. So what they actually do for coronary bypass is take a vessel from somewhere else, attach it up above the blockage, and provide a new route around it. And that's what a coronary bypass is. You're bypassing the blocked area. Okay. Stents are also used, um, etc. All right. Um, amazingly enough, your heart tissue can still survive and not die even with 85 to 90 percent blockage. Okay. Once you get beyond that almost full blockage, um, that is when you have death of the tissue, and there's no coming back from that, um, as far as we know yet. All right. We'll talk about some studies when I see you in person.
Okay? Alright, this is going to end part one of the heart lecture series. I'm going to go ahead and put this up for you and hope you're having a good day. Bye!